grace to you and peace from the God who makes us God's own. Every year, we begin Lent in the wilderness. I suspect that we may all picture different things when we think of the wilderness. For me, I think of the Colorado backcountry near where I grew up, where sometimes hikers go missing or die climbing mountains. But there are all kinds of wilderness. Maybe for you, it's the endless, unforgiving prairie. Or maybe like the people of ancient Israel, you think of a hot, scrubby desert. But I also suspect that regardless of what we imagine, our ideas of wilderness have something in common. The wilderness is a dangerous and often unnerving place. And the first Sunday in Lent always comes with one particular story from the wilderness. The story of the temptation of Christ. This year we heard the story as it is told in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness where he doesn't eat anything for 40 days. Famished and exhausted, Jesus is deeply vulnerable. So, of course, that's when the devil shows up. If you are the Son of God, the devil says, turn these stones into bread. Bow to me and every kingdom in the world will be yours. Throw yourself from the temple so that God's angels will save you. It's very tricky of the devil, don't you think? So tricky that sometimes we ourselves are tempted to miss the point of the story. We tend to focus on the temptations themselves and then speculate about how we can resist temptation in our own lives so that we can be more like Jesus. But like the sly dog he is, the devil hopes that we'll skate past how he begins. If you are the son of God. And I think that's what this story is really about. It's about Jesus' identity. And it's about ours. In the chapter right before this story, the Gospel of Luke tells us about Jesus' baptism. As Jesus stands in the waters of the Jordan, the heavens part and the Holy Spirit descends upon him. And a voice booms from the sky with the words, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Jesus is God's son. It's a very special identity, one that comes with a special vocation, a special purpose here on earth. As the Son of God, Jesus has a unique relationship with God that grounds everything he is and everything he has come to do. And that's crucial because the devil knows that in the wilderness, with nothing around you to hold you in place, identity is often the first thing to slip. So that's where he begins his attack. And he begins with an attack on this identity, this relationship with God, because it has worked before. You see, for the writers of the Gospels, this story has a lot to do with other famous stories of temptation. For example, there's the story of Adam and Eve. In the Garden of Eden, the certain serpent came to the couple and suggested that they eat a fruit that God had warned them not to eat, lest they die. But the serpent tells them, you won't die, you'll just become more like God. And that's where they fail. The temptation is to become more like God, to have more power, to establish their worth on their own terms, and to do so for their own purposes. Up until then, Adam and Eve had been defined by their relationship to the God who had provided everything for them. But the temptation was to secure their identity for themselves. Or take the people of Israel as they wandered through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. Their leader, Moses, left for several days so that he could talk with God on Mount Sinai. And in their fear and insecurity, the people of Israel made for themselves a golden calf as an idol. 
rather than trusting in their relationship with the God who had named and claimed them as God's own people, they turned in on themselves and tried to rely on a God of their own making. Time and time again, we humans fall into this trap. We promise ourselves that if we can achieve this or that, we will use our achievements for good. We will rule justly. We'll be fair. The church has been telling itself this lie for hundreds of years. But the legacy that we've left behind includes an awful lot of sin. Because what the devil promises simply isn't true. When we put our faith in anything but God, when our identity is tied to anything we think we've achieved for ourselves, it crumbles away or burdens our neighbors. We fail to ground our being in God, and the tragic consequence is that we inevitably end up struggling to define ourselves against each other. Because ultimately, we cannot be secure in our identities for their own sake. Every day, we are bombarded by cultural pressures and institutionalized structures that seek to pit our sense of identity, our very worth, against our neighbors and ourselves. We are told that we are not beautiful enough, not smart enough, not righteous enough to be worthy. And if we do achieve those things, we are tempted to hoard those blessings away from our neighbors, lest we lose them. Luckily, God knows that we are susceptible to this. And therefore, God reminds us again and again of who we are and whose we are. I'm going to take you on a journey now for a moment, and it's going to feel like we're traveling far afield, but hang in there, because the word of God is astounding, and I promise we'll find our way back on track in a moment. Our first reading for today was from Deuteronomy. We'll take a look at this text together in just a moment, but it might help to have a little bit of context. Deuteronomy is one of the first five books of the Bible, and it was deeply important to the people of ancient Israel because it contained most of the laws according to which the people of Israel lived. In fact, in today's gospel reading, every time Jesus rebukes the devil, he's quoting from Deuteronomy. But it's a hard book to get into because it's also generally pretty dry and repetitive and legalistic and did a wonderful job of reading it for us today with lots of life. But generally speaking, Deuteronomy, it's a tough book. The passage we heard this morning comes from the end of a long section about ritual celebrations and sacrifices. In it, the Israelites are reminded of the wondrous things God has done. God made promises rooted in friendship and love to their ancestors that they would have land and many descendants. God brought those descendants out of slavery in Egypt with grand displays. And then God gave them land. Not just any land, but a beautiful and bounteous land flowing with milk and honey. And so, in recognition of what God has already done, the Israelites are instructed to bring the first fruits of their harvest to the temple. Let's read it again together. We'll be starting with verse 6, if you would like to follow along in your Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 6 through 11. Let's see. You know I'm having a hard time finding it, so I'll read it to you. If you find it, you're welcome to join along with me. It says, When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. Oh, I see. It begins with the red. (laughs) Mary did such a good job. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power, and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and your house. Did you catch it? The Israelites are commanded to bring a sacrifice of their first and best before God. But who actually eats it? You can answer, it's okay. Who eats the sacrifice? They do. The people of God. The sacrifice is feast food. God's command to give first fruits to God might be paraphrased this way. Take the first fruits of your labor and throw a party. But not just any party. Throw a party that includes those who cannot grow food for themselves. The Levites, the aliens, the widows and orphans and vulnerable people. Those who journey through their own kinds of wilderness. Revel in the abundance that your God has given you, Deuteronomy says. Revel in the fellowship it engenders in your wider community and don't forget to include the people who have less. The first and best is set aside not for profit or subsistence, not to be wasted in a sacrifice that God won't consume himself, but for the work of God, which is always concerned with creating better, more, richer life for everyone. This reading from Deuteronomy might seem like an odd pairing for, with the story about the temptation of Christ, but I think that they're paired up because both of them are meant to remind us of God's abundance. We are meant to remember that everything we possess has its origin in God, and our identity is first and foremost as children of God. But it's important to note that this relationship to God, this identity that we are given as God's people, isn't something that means we should turn inward in our partying. No, we are called to blossom outward, to burst towards the other in delight. This passage in Deuteronomy commands that the Israelites remember the Levites and the aliens the people who didn't have their own land and therefore couldn't produce their own produce or livestock like other people. These are meant to be invited to the party because God's bounty is meant to be shared. God's generosity is inclusive. And the identity that we are given as God's children gathers us into a community that is far better than anything that we could try to accomplish defining ourselves on our own. And that, that's deeply troubling for the devil. Because the devil would like nothing more than to tear us apart, to tear us from God and from each other. In today's gospel story, Jesus falls back on his relationship with his father and overcomes the devil's temptations. Over and over, he chooses to rely on his identity as the son of God not in order to place himself among the privileged few, but among the ordinary people of God. For Jesus, being the Son of God means that he accepts his humanity and lives as others do. He doesn't turn turn stones to bread, even though he could, because the hungry and the poor of this world don't have that option. He doesn't throw himself from the pinnacle of the temple even though he wouldn't be harmed because even the mighty of this world can't do that. And even though he could seek a throne of glory and take his place as ruler of all the kingdoms of the world, he does not. Because he comes to stand in solidarity with those who will never rule even their own lives. Jesus has come to bear the burdens of all humanity to share in our condition, even our temptations, not to place himself above them. And in so doing, he gives us a new identity as saved and redeemed children of God. 
And that's good news for us. Jesus has succeeded even when we cannot. He faces the wilderness and its temptations by resting in his relationship with God, knowing that he is dependent on the providence, care, and protection of the God who has promised to care for him and for all of us. Amen.